Okay, so now we're back on a brand new untitled document and we're going to look at manipulating images and importing images into Photoshop because it's all well and good learning how to do drawings with a brush tool but really what we want to be doing with Photoshop is photo manipulation and layout and I've got a folder here that's got some images that we're going to use for this part of the tutorial and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on it drag it and drop it into my page and you can see that it has added it in and we've got the bounding box just like we had when we were using the free transform tool and just like the free transform tool we can grab hold of the corners and stretch this image out if we want to or if we want to be a bit more sensible about it let me just drag that and drop it back in as it's a photograph we want to make sure that it maintains its aspect ratio so we're going to link the width and the height so now when we drag it out to fill the entire screen we will actually lose some of it it'll disappear off the edge so we've got to figure out exactly how we want to crop this so as we move it slightly over yeah let's move it let's move it over like that so we've got a bit of land bit of sea and when we're happy we hit the tick and that's now inserted on a new layer called beach it's called beach because that was the name of the jpeg that we dragged in so it will have whatever name it is so if you download it off google images and it's got an incredibly long and complicated name that will be in there and don't forget you can just double click in it and change that to whatever you want it to be now you'll remember from the first part of these tutorials if i now take a paintbrush and start painting on it well you can see that i've got that nope icon as i call it because we've got this little icon down here what it's saying is if you click on it we can't do anything with this smart object. Now with Photoshop, you can do 3D wire mesh manipulations. You can actually edit video in it if you're so inclined to do it frame by frame. So Photoshop's just saying here, I'm not actually sure what it is that I'm looking at. If you want to be able to edit this, you will need to rasterize it. So essentially turn it into pixel data. So we can say, yep, okay, we're happy with that. That little icon disappears, and now we can scribble all over it to our heart's content. But we don't want to do that, so Control Z. What we want to do is start learning how to lay out properly. But the first thing I want to do is make sure that, especially when you're working with print work, sometimes you might have noticed that when you print things out, you'll lose information around the edges. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm not putting anything too close to the edges and it's also a great way of showing you another tool called the rulers. So I'm going to move on to the move tool because that enables me when I hover over these rulers here to actually click and drag down from them. And you'll see on the left hand side I can actually move in and have one centimetre in from the edge, a blue line. Now if you don't want to go on centimetres you can actually right click on the rulers and change that to whatever size you want. So you might want to go for millimetres but for now I'm just going to leave it on centimetres. And what I'm going to do down here at the bottom is I'm going to create a margin one centimeter in from here. So that's 21 centimeters. So if I drop that at 20 and then I'll drag one over here. What's this end? This end is 29.7. So let's go 28.7. I'm not being 100% accurate. They're just visual guides. Now these will not appear on your print when you print it out. They're simply guidelines and you can even use them for finding the center point. of your image and they are great also if I take them off and they are also great for doing your rule of thirds so when you're doing your composition you can make sure that you are composing thoughtfully using the rule of thirds now as with everything there is a shortcut to turn them on and off but in the view menu you'll see here we can show guide so that's control and semicolon and if you use control and semicolon you can turn them on and off so you can check everything is lining up all your text is lining up and then turn them off again so that you can see your image clearly what's interesting is if you use control and apostrophe brings up this grid that enables you to have a quick reference to make sure that everything is symmetrical and that everything is sitting on the lines and conforming to a grid especially useful when you're working on magazine pages and they use that grid format so control apostrophe does your grid and control semicolon does your guides. Okay, so I wanna make a fragrance advert that's kind of romantic. It uses this tropical island vibe, but I want it to be at night time and I don't want all of these ships in the way. So I'm gonna to have to do some photo manipulation in order to achieve my goals. So what I'm gonna do is holding down Alt 
zoom in using the scroll wheel on this area and then remember spacebar enables me to move around the page and I can have a better look here and I can see all of these ships but I don't really want them there so how am I going to get rid of them well I could use the eyedropper tool which is over here select this color of blue take my brush tool and then hopefully paint it out without it looking too shocking and sometimes you can get away with that but you'll notice that because we've got this grain effect here where I have done the um, paintbrush there is no grain over the paintbrush it's just a solid color so that's probably not the best solution at this point in time so what's another option that I've got well another option over here is the spot healing brush tool so what you can do again you can make it bigger or smaller using the square brackets or by right clicking and choosing the size and what we're going to do is we are going to draw over the object that we want to get rid of with this little sort of shading area and when we let go the computer's going to try and get rid of it for us now it's done a fantastic job of getting rid of the boat but unfortunately sometimes it does this where it's not quite sure what to put in its place and you end up with this weird sort of doubling up effect now you can get lucky like i just did there where after a few attempts you can paint it out but let me show you a, a more surefire way of doing it. You see, there we go. We've got some of this boat being resampled and put in here. So it's not going to work. Well, you can also use the healing brush tool, which enables you to, if I just click now, you'll see it tells me off. I need to alt click to define a source point to be used to repair the image. So what I can do is say, well, if I draw my spot healing brush tool across here, it's gonna resample the ship into it. I don't want it to resample from here. What I want it to do is to sample from the sky above it. Well, that's when you use the healing brush tool and you alt click. You get that little target to say, where are you sampling from above the object? And now you can actually see I can paint out using the sky above. But again, you can see it's not a perfect finish because it's trying to resample. What you can sometimes do is you can sometimes get lucky by painting out several of the objects like so and then going back to the spot healing brush tool and hoping that it corrects it for you but you can see it's it really is hit and miss now don't get me wrong taking spots and blemishes off people's faces is an absolute doddle with this healing brush tool but when you're trying to do intricate details and you do have clear geometric lines it can be really really difficult so i just undo back to where we were and I'll use another one of these healing tools. It's called the patch tool. And what you can do is draw an area on your image that you want to adjust. And then when you press Shift F5, you will be able to do a content aware fill. And again, you can see that it almost achieves what we're looking for, but you probably will need to come in with your eyedropper tool and a nice soft brush and just do a few minor repairs to the sea. The thing you've got to remember is currently we are really, really tightly zoomed in. And when I zoom out, it's unlikely you're going to see those tiny little imperfections that we can see at the pixel level here once I've done the rest of my manipulation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to paint out the extra bits and then we'll move on. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do now that I've got rid of the boats in the distance is I want to separate the sky from the rest of the island. Now there's various different ways I can do that. One of the ways I can do it is to use a lasso tool. Now the lasso tool allows us to click on an area and draw freehand a line around things that have got a weird shape. And then when we let go, it completes that as a selection area. And you can see my marching ants. But what you can also see is that that is very inaccurate. And if I was to start editing this area, making it nighttime, I'm gonna have a lot of blue in places that I don't want blue. And I'm gonna have a lot of nighttime in my sea where I don't want nighttime. So is there another way of being a bit more accurate? Well, yeah, there is. There's the polygon lasso tool, which means that it will draw straight lines to every click. And then we double click to close it at the end. But again, it's only straight lines. So the third option here is the magnetic lasso tool. The magnetic lasso tool is great because we can click on an object here and you'll see that we can then follow the outline of the object and it will add points in for us. Everywhere where we get a weird bit of a shape, we might want to step over 
and add a couple of clicks ourselves. But the rest of the time, Photoshop's doing a great job of following the edge of that object for us. And we can get some really neat, tidy, and intricate edges on our, uh, let me just draw the box here. So you can see we've got some very neat edges that follow very closely the object that we're trying to manipulate. But they're still not exact and as you can imagine, drawing around the entirety of all of these trees is going to take me forever. And all it takes is one misclick, and I accidentally double click, and now I've closed my shape. And unfortunately, I'd have to start again if I wanted to choose a different shape. So, what's another way we can do this? Well, underneath the magnetic lasso tool is the wand tool. Now, the wand is a great, great tool because it allows us to select large areas based on a tolerance. Now tolerance is essentially me saying, I would like you to select all of this blue that is similar by a factor of, of essentially 50%. And so you can see that as soon as it starts getting too light from this blue that I clicked on, it's no longer selecting it. And certainly where it's white, where the clouds are, it's not selecting it either. Now we could be cheeky and we could try putting this up to 100% and clicking on the blue. I think you'll find that we start getting that blue coming through into the oceans. So I don't think we're going to be lucky on this one. So what can we do? Well, one of the great things about this is we could go back to our 50% tolerance and click. And you'll notice that we get a uh, where the, the arrow is, we've got a patch icon. It says we're patch editing. And so if I hold down shift, you'll see a plus. And if I hold down alt, you'll see a minus. And I imagine you can guess that if I hold it down and click when it's plus it adds it to my selection and I can just click and keep adding all of this with a 50% tolerance now you are going to see down here we've got a bit of an issue but I'm adding all of that to my selection I'm adding all of this to my selection I'm going to add that bit to my selection and that bit so now I've got a pretty solid selection along my marching ants if you have a look at them it's not 100% perfect and we're certainly going to have some issues with this blue coming through the trees but we're pretty much there, except in the ocean. And that is why we've got this great feature of dropping the tolerance down to maybe 10 and holding the Alt instead to minus away this dark blue. Now, I'm not going to worry about getting all of this outside of the area perfect, because what I'm going to show you now is how to copy that onto a new layer. Now, you could say Edit Copy and then go over create a new layer in the bottom right hand corner and then go back to edit paste but there is a much much easier shortcut which is Control J and you'll see that what it's done if I turn off my beach it has copied that sky information that was selected onto a brand new layer which we are then going to call sky and you can see that when I zoom in the reason I said that this information wasn't too important because I can actually come in with my eraser tool now and just tidy up any of those loose ends that I don't want. Again, we can zoom in and use our square brackets if we want to tidy up a little bit more. Now, if you were doing this as professional, you would be wanting to feather these edges and have a much cleaner line. But as it's possibly your first go at Photoshop, let's try and keep it straightforward and relatively simple. What are we going to do now? Well, we're going to try and make the sky look like night. And in order to do this, I'm going to introduce you to some of the drop down menu tools. So over here in the image manipulation tools, you actually have an area called adjustments. And those adjustments can be brightness and contrast. So let's have a look. If I turn the brightness down, oh, already it's starting to look a little bit darker. If I turn the contrast up, well, the problem is my clouds are now really, really sharp and a lot whiter than they were. If I zoom down the other way, it all goes a little bit grey and a little bit dull. So maybe I'll cancel out of that one and I'll try something else. Well, one of the great tools that you get in Photoshop is the ability to adjust levels. And you will be using Control L a lot because that gives you the histogram. Now, if you're taking photos properly, you're probably checking the histogram on the camera to make sure that you've got a nice even blacks through midtones to white spread and not a big peak in the middle so that you know you've exposed your shot properly. But we can also mess around with this exposure by saying, actually, all of this dark blue data down here, we want you to treat that as black. And you can see how it all starts getting much, much darker. I'm going to move my mid-tones over and say, well, actually, a lot of those whites I want to be mid-tones. And then I've still got the issue with these clouds here. 
So down here, what I'm going to do is tell it to ignore a lot of that white data. And you can see that most of my clouds have now disappeared. Now I could take them off all the way, but I may as well have just painted a black background in at that point. So what I want to do is leave a little bit of it in there, but not too much. So we hit OK. We could also then come back into the adjustments and look at things like hue and saturation. So hue is color. So if I mess around with the hue, you'll see that it's actually, we can get some lovely, lovely effects on it. But um, I don't want to be changing the color. I quite like the color of the sky being blue. But you can pull down your saturation to get rid of some of that blue or amp it up if you wanted it. And you can mess around with the lightness, which I'm just going to do here. I'm going to knock a little bit of the lightness down. I'm going to knock the saturation down a little bit and I'm going to make sure that the hues is pretty much at zero. Now this is a great way also of colorizing images. If I hit colorize and I go over to, to purple and then I push the saturation up, you'll see that I can actually sort of change colors of skies. So what we're doing here is we're just trying to knock the lightness down and take out a little bit of the blue in that saturation. So what we're going to need to do now is on the beach layer, because remember the beach is underneath our sky layer, we're going to have to fix this issue here under the trees. Now we could get in here, we could use our eyedropper tool, click on it, get that dark blue, get our brush tool out and start painting, which is not the worst solution, but I would also argue it looks pretty ugly. So what we're going to do is we're going to undo that and we're going to use another tool that you haven't seen yet, which is over here. And we've got the dodge and burn tools. And this enables us to manipulate the image and kind of like the exposure. So if I click on dodge, you'll see that it gets lighter. Let me just undo that. And if I click on burn, you'll see that it gets darker. And quite often, by messing around with our midtones and our exposure levels, we can get some much more convincing and less abrupt transitions between background and foreground objects. So I'm just going to tidy up underneath these trees and then we'll get back to it. Okay, so we finished using our burn tool and we've managed to take out a lot of that light blue and it looks a lot more appealing and a lot more like it's actually at night. So now I'm ready to bring in my bottle and I'm going to use this bottle. You see we get our transform bounding box. I'm just going to accept it for now. We can't edit this layer because we need to remember to rasterize it. So I'm going to do it this way this time. And the issue I've got with this bottle is that it is stuck on a white background. Now can we think of any tools that we've used that might be able to help us cut this out? Well yeah we could use our magnetic lasso tool but going around this circle with a magnetic lasso is going to take an incredibly long time. So let's try using our magic wand tool. Set our tolerance to oh, no, 25%. Click and you can see straight away we have selected all of the white around the object. And we've got a little bit of mess here in the shadow where it's not quite sure what to do but for the vast majority of the time it gets it pretty close. If I deselect that I'll also show you the quick selection tool. You'll notice that here the tolerance has gone away and what you actually do is draw like you're using a brush and as you draw it will automatically try and work out the best tolerance for you. So if you're having problems with the magic wand tool maybe you can try this quick selection tool and you can see we get a fairly similar result but if I zoom in you'll notice we are losing a slight bit of the neck of the bottle there. So I find that it's better to persevere with the magic wand tool and get your tolerance right so you don't lose bits of your object. But it is trial and error, you just get used to eyeballing the tolerance um, and it will come with time. So I'm just going to press the delete key now and everything that I had selected, which was the white, will be deleted. And I'm going to press Control D to deselect my marching ants. And now using V, my move tool, I can move my bottle around within my composition. So I think it's probably going to sit somewhere like this. I mean, it, it would be a shame to stick it right over the bit I've just photoshopped with the burn tool. So um, let's stick it here, maybe a little bit further over. Um, and I want this to be a bit more round. So I'm going to press Control T to bring up my free transform again. And this time I'm just going to squash it down. So you'll notice that it is not deforming. It's because my width and my height are linked. So I'm just going to hit Escape to undo that. Control T again, and I could either uncheck this or I could simply hold down the shift key, which overrides 
the width and the height linking so I want it roughly that sort of size that looks a little bit more round because I'm thinking it's going to link in with a moon hence the fact that I've got a moon image here and here that I might be working with so I've got my round bottle which is going to tie in with the moon but I don't have a moon in the sky so opening up my folder I'm going to grab actually I'll try this one oh there we go that doesn't look too bad I'll say yep it's fine at that size now we all know there's many many different ways of doing this but because we've got all of these little dots in the sky I think a quick selection tool is going to leave lots of little dots everywhere in mind so I'm going to start off by drawing a box around it with the marquee tool now the problem is if I press delete now it's going to say that it's a smart object so I can't do anything with it let's rasterize that layer if I press delete now it's just going to delete the bit that I need so what we can do is use select and inverse and that will select everything else apart from the thing that I've drawn the box around and when I press delete it will get rid of everything else on that layer now when I zoom in with my magic wand tool and I click on the black I don't have to worry about all of those stars when I delete them out so there we go I've got my moon and I've got my ocean and I've got my sky and it's all looking very composited it looks like this has all been stuck on so I'm just going to make this moon a little bit bigger, make it a bit more impressive. But now how can I start tying these objects in together? Well, one of the best ways of doing that is to use opacity. Now you'll see here opacity controls how much you can see through or not see through an object. Now obviously we wouldn't be able to see all the way through the moon to the stars behind. But if we want to just bring down that brightness, we can actually just knock back the opacity slightly. Now the problem with once we start messing with this layer, we won't be able to go back to the original without re-importing it. So one of the things that I like to do is to actually duplicate a layer before I start working on it. So I've got that copy of it and I'm just going to pop it out the way so that if I need to come back to that moon, I've got a copy of it exactly where it is in the sky. So the first thing I'm going to do is knock the opacity down slightly and then I'm thinking it doesn't feel very much like the moon and the reason for that is it looks like the clouds actually go in front of my moon. So let me take my moon, let's move it a little bit, yeah we've got the moon in front of the clouds so this isn't really going to work for me. By using my opacity I could knock the opacity of the moon down. I can see the clouds through it, I'm going to ignore this one because it's, I didn't even notice that one just now. I'm going to take my eraser tool make it a very soft edge nice and big and I'm just going to gently nudge off the edge of the moon so that when I put the opacity back up we end up with some clouds that are nice and fuzzy edged in front of the moon there Ooh, moon's too bright let's knock it down a bit more yeah, about 82 percent so now when I zoom out it looks a little bit more believable now obviously I'm rushing I'd probably spend a bit more time to feather that possibly even layer in some cloud from another stock image over the front of it there I've just spotted that this is very similar to that so luckily I've got my moon copy which I'm going to duplicate again and I'm going to bring that up and turn it on because I'm actually going to use this for the top of my bottle as well so if I can knock the opacity down, control T, make it smaller, get it roughly the right size, hit enter, well we're close enough and because I've knocked the opacity down, you see if I put it all the way up, totally not believable and if I can knock it down it gives me that moon texture in the white without me actually having to worry about painting that texture in. Now my, what I might want to do is zoom in here and I don't think that's the moon yeah I think that's the the edge of my bottle because I cut it out using the magic wand tool it has left some of that white background so I could get in here and tidy that white background off using the erase tool and then when I put my moon back on there we go we don't necessarily have that white coming through now. We've got our moon in the sky and we've got our moon on our bottle. Now we could go moontastic, being as I've got another copy of the moon here. Why don't I bring that moon down and stick it in the ocean? 
Now obviously this doesn't look very convincing as an ocean moon. So we're going to have to do several things. First of all, we're going to want to make it a little bit smaller and we're going to want to maybe think about perspective. So I'm going to hold control and make it narrower at one end than it is at the other. Put it onto a flat plane so it looks like it's being reflected. There we go. And then we're going to knock the opacity down so it looks a bit more convincingly like a reflection in the water. But we're at an impasse. There's nothing else we can do with these simple tools to make it look more realistic. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over into using filters. So in the pull down menu here, we, if we know what filter it is that we're using, we can just pull it from a text menu, but sometimes we don't. So what we can do is go straight to our filter gallery. And the filter gallery allows us to see previews of all of the different filters that we can apply. And this one here, Ocean Ripple, is super helpful. We can adjust the ripple size to make it look more like it's rippling on the water. And we can change the magnitude as well, which is how much it ripples. So more or less rippling. So I quite like that ripple effect. So we'll hit OK. And now we've got our Ocean Ripple. But it still doesn't look hugely convincing. Now we could add something as straightforward as a wave distortion, but where would the fun in that be? Let's try and do something slightly differently. I'm actually gonna add wind. And what the wind does is it kind of smears it. You can see there, I want the wind to come from the left and then we can blast it. So we've got that idea of the texture, but we've got that sort of tear effect. And then the final thing I want to use is liquify. What we can do is we can take this liquify tool, which basically makes our finger like a smudge stick in art to make it look like it's kind of rippling in water. So I'm just going to sort of eat into it slightly, just make it a little bit more convincing. And we're just going to tuck in these corners. So now it looks a little bit more like it's rippling on the surface of the water. Now we're not going to be drawing a huge amount of attention to this. So I am going to want to move the opacity down. I just wanted to add that extra layer of believability in. It makes it feel like the moon is actually there and not quite so obviously photoshopped in as it is. So now we're going to move on to our text editor because that's pretty much, apart from the pen tool, the only tool that we haven't used in the toolbar today. So we're doing really, really well. Now, there's all sorts of different type tools, but most of the time you're going to be writing horizontally, as in the way that we normally write in a book or we read in magazines. So I would recommend not drawing a bounding box because it forces your text into that area. What you should be doing is just clicking anywhere you like on the screen. And I'm just going to click, and that gives me my lorem ipsum placeholder text so I can type in uh, whatever it is that I want. So um, what's my slogan going to be? Um, love the night. Awful slogan, but that'll do. And I can, using my move tool, you'll notice if I click inside here, I'm actually editing it. But as I hover away, you can see I've got a little arrow with a move. I can move my text to roughly where I want it. Now, how close to the edge can I go? Well, remember, control and semicolon brings up your guides and what I really want to do is I want to keep this on this line and no closer than a centimeter from the edge so it means that I've got some other adjustments to do on this side so I'm just going to say yes to the text okay so I've got my bottle and the moon that are on the bottle these two layers I can put them together and I can even control click so they're both selected and come down here to where the chain is and link them and now you'll see that they're linked and whatever I do to one layer will happen to the other layer which means that they will move together. Right, I've got my layout a little bit better so I can turn my guides off now. So you notice when I click, it automatically creates a new layer. And when I type the amazingly insightful name of my product, we're gonna call it Moon. When I type Moon, you'll see that it actually uses the text that I've typed in order to create that layer. So we're gonna work on Moon here. Moon, we can't see because it's white. So how do we adjust that? Well, the great thing about it is when we have our text tool open, up here, we have a little um, panel that flicks out that has all of the information that we need. So we can adjust the font itself through this pull down menu. So let's, um, let's try something that's a bit more 
like black adder now we can't see it because of the color so let's just choose a black color so we can see it now oh yeah that's a much more interesting font that we might see on a uh, on a bottle now the issue that we've got is uh, we need to select that text and we need to make it a bit smaller and we can do all sorts of adjustments we can add space between the letters using this VA we can change the thickness of the letters themselves using the T and more importantly we can change the color directly from in here you can even use the eyedropper tool inside the image itself to select one of the colors that you've already used so I'm thinking maybe that's oh, hello that sort of yeah and that sort of color will do for now now you might argue that this isn't very convincingly stuck on the bottle because it doesn't feel like it wraps around well that's a great thing about the title tool we can select the text again and up here you can see a text warp tool and what we might do is just add a lower arc on that I'm probably going to bend it a little less than that but I want to give it that sort of idea that it has been bent slightly around the bottle what we can do is we can actually take our text layer and right next to normally where we would double click on the word in order to change the name of the layer what we can actually do is double click on this big gray space to the side and it gives us a layer style panel yep you have to be psychic to find that one but what the layer style does is it means that we can add effects to our layers so it's not going to affect the whole image it's just going to affect the layer that we're working on another reason why it's great to keep everything on separate layers so what we're going to do is we're going to look at doing a, um, a gradient overlay and when you click on the gradient overlay it automatically selects it and there are actually a lot of presets so I might check the purples preset so what are these gradients well you can apply them and as you see that's disgusting but I'm sure there's a use for it somewhere unfortunately none of these match my needs so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to click out of that and I'm going to click on the gradient editor which enables me to choose my lower color and then I can either click into the color and select the specific color use the color codes from earlier on if I've got a specific house style or I can use my eyedropper tool which is what I'm going to do I'm going to choose one of these dark purpley colors I want to go nice and dark purple for the bottom okay and then my highlights over here I click on this one and I can choose again uh, a color code or I can just click inside the object and get one of the lighter shades like this one and hit OK and now I've got that color gradient going on I think that looks a little bit nicer it makes it look like it's more on the bottle it kind of fits in with it a little bit more but again let's add one more layer effect so double click and I'm going to add a slight bevel or emboss now bevel and emboss you've got to be careful because sometimes it can make it look even more stuck on than it is but what we're going to try and do is an emboss and using the scroll wheel we're just going to change the depth slightly of that emboss just to give us a little bit of a shadow effect on it and make it look like it is stuck on to the bottle so there we go so rapidly running out of time um, I need to very quickly jump over and do something with this text here so make sure you've got the correct layer selected love the night is an interesting I'm just going to move it over slightly to make it balance now it's an interesting font so I'm just going to leave it I'm going to jump in to the layer effects and try and make it look a bit more exciting I'm going to do that by using an outer glow and this glow we can use different types of glow so a normal glow will just look bright and if you step through the different blend modes you can get those sort of pixelated effects or one of the ones that I think looks really really nice when you're trying to make something stand out is either to use lighten or to use where has it gone here not vivid light difference which um, helps to lift it off the background it creates essentially a difference mat and pulls it out from the background so I think that's really nice uh, we might want to have a look at the spread here so see how far it spreads maybe the size make it smooth out a little bit there we go so it's not too much of a big block of color behind it but that kind of matches our nighttime sky but I think we haven't really gone over the top enough with the moon. We've got moon here, we've got moon here, we've got moon here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use even more moon and we're going to use it on the text here because I quite like the way this is broken up and it's reminding me of the lunar surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go onto my, yeah, there's my moon layer. Using my marquee tool, I'm going to select 
the moon itself. So I've got some moon texture and I'm going to go into edit define pattern and we're going to call this pattern moon. So now control D to deselect. I can come to my text here and on love the night I can actually do instead of a gradient overlay which you've seen I can do a pattern overlay. Oh, and it's defaulted to it already. So you could use all of the default patterns that exist in here, like trees and grass and water. They're pretty terrible. You're better off just taking an image, cutting it out yourself, and then having a little play with the opacity to sort of bring it through slightly. And then the scale is obviously how many times it will repeat that pattern. So if you zoom it all the way out, you can see there's lots of little squares that I cut out of the moon. So you want to have a little bit of an adjustment with that so you don't end up with that grid effect. Oh, that looks nice. Yep. Yeah, okay. We hit OK. And now we've got that texture. Maybe it's a little bit faint. Let's just go back in. Go back into our pattern overlay. Let's make it a bit more obvious. There we go. And when we zoom out, Control Zero, we've got that moon sort of texture on our text. I mean, we've gone moon tastic, really, haven't we? So there we've covered most of the basic features, apart from probably the most important one, and that is when we save our work. So let's finish off by looking in the file menu here, where we can say save or save as. If we click save, which is control S, and we're gonna be doing it all the time, we get the opportunity to save as a .psd file. This is a Photoshop document. So without a .psd file, we cannot get back in here and we cannot alter anything at all. The Photoshop document is the one that has all the layers in it. So we need to make sure that we save our master or our main PSD file so that we can come back and we can edit it in the future. And you may get a pop-up talking about maximized compatibility. Yeah, don't worry about it. Now you'll notice up here it says the name on the tab that we're working on. And if I make a slight adjustment to it, let's let's just move this text ever so slightly over here. You'll see we get a little asterisk appear. That is saying you've not saved your document since you made an adjustment to it. And all we need to do is remember to keep hitting Control S and it will save it. And so every time we see that asterisk, it should be reminding us, oh, yep, I need to save. Remember, if we're working on lots of separate layers, keeping all our elements separate, it shouldn't matter how often we save because we're not going to blow away any information. It's non-destructive editing. But what I'll show you now is that that PSD, the master.psd, is 41 megabytes. So that's a pretty large file. And it's certainly going to get larger and larger the more layers we put in. Whereas a JPEG of a bottle is 33 kilobytes. So that is a much, much smaller image. So what's the difference? Well, it's the file extension. This is a .jpg or a JPEG. And this is a .psd or a Photoshop document. So what we can do is say file save as. And this time we can use this drop down menu to choose a JPEG and we'll call it just master JPEG for now. Hit save. We'll get some JPEG options that pop up asking us what sort of quality we want it and it'll tell us how big it's going to be. So it's still going to be 2.7 meg. Maybe if I drop it down to half quality. Oh yeah, we're below a megabyte at this point. Let's hit OK. It has saved it as a JPEG, but we're still working on the PSD file. You know, it hasn't opened the JPEG in this window. And if we jump back in here, well, here's our master JPEG. And you see it's 623 kilobytes. And we can, in fact, we can drag and drop this up onto this bar here. And we'll get that open in a new tab. So we can see all of our hard work. And you'll notice there are no layers in this JPEG. So if we wanted to move this text, well, we would be out of luck because it exists all as one single image whereas we can still continue to edit in the Photoshop document. So now you should have pasted into your PowerPoint document evidence of you going through the Photoshop tools and learning the different elements. And so if you've got examples of some of the key tools being used, like selection tools, brush tools and also adding layer effects that's brilliant make sure you keep that make sure you save it somewhere safe because we're going to be using that in our evidence to the exam board and if you have time left i want you to look at the mini brief document and move on to creating an advert of your own